to time so we don't go beyond so we don't go beyond the allotted time for each um, item on the agenda. Good afternoon, or should I say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever it is you're joining from. My name is Dr. Tumsia. Uh, I'm sure people who have joined earlier, our sessions earlier are familiar with the face and the name, but then it's still okay for an introduction each and every time. I am the Community Engagement Manager for Famalat. And you're welcome to yet another session of the telemedicine um, education series. So today's topic hmm, is very, very interesting. I know for everyone, because um, seeing the number of um, veterinarians that registered for the session, like it gave me, um, I was happy to see that, you know, a lot of people are ready to learn, even though we're all doctors, but we just keep learning. The day you die, you stop learning. But as long as you're alive, you keep learning and improving on your practices. So welcome on board, everyone. So our topic for today is, um, hello, can you hear me? Hello, oh, sorry, my apologies. So our topic for today is contagious bovine pleural pneumonia, the disease, the epidemiology, and then the role we veterinarians have in curbing this disease. So I'll be taking through, um, I'll be taking us through the process of this session. As I said, I'll be facilitating. So this um, tele-education series, basically TECLA, that's the acronym, which means tele-education for clinicians and leaders in Africa. Famalat is um, hosting this, supported by MDOC, Baringa Ingleham, Making More Health, and Ashoka Africa. Um, it's been really exciting. And oh, I can see Dr. Charles Eby. Thank you for joining, sir. Uh, so today, I'll be taking us through the agenda first. As I said, we'll be, we'll be very time conscious. Uh, introduction, and then a brief about Famalat, a brief about Project Tecla. We're going to take a pre-quiz um, for just three minutes and then the didactic pre um, presentation um, for 15 minutes and then a case presentation, a real life um, case presentation, and then open discussion for all participants, questions and answers. And this is where Echo Model is big on. Like we're going to take uh, more than 50% of the time to discuss and uh, to discuss around the topic your questions and answers are welcome, your comments, your suggestions. So we're going to be doing that for 40 minutes. And um, we're going to get to recommendations from our hub experts present in the room. And then we're going to also take a post quiz, basically a pre-quiz and a post quiz is the same question. We just want to know how much you've gained um, during the presentation and um, that's just about it. And then just the summarization uh, at the end of um, the post quiz and then announcements for our next um, sessions and then any other announcement we have. So I can see our case presenter joining. We have our hub experts joining in. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to be giving you some few um, steps or let me say guides just to enjoy uh, the session. So these are the four pillars which holds the ECHO model. So ECHO model basically uses video conference technology to leverage scarce healthcare resources, specialist sharing best practices with colleagues, case-based learning and continuous monitoring of this program's um, outcome. Um, next slide, please. So please take note, Project Tecla leverages the ECHO model we collect registration, participation, questions and answers, chat comments, poll responses for our programs. Your individual data will be kept confidential and handled by authorized personnel. These data may be used for reports, maps, communication, surveys, quality assurance, evaluation, research, and also to um, inform new initiatives. So the session will be recorded, uh, is being recorded, and um, we'll be sharing PDF version of the slides after the session. Thank you. Next slide, please. So these are the participation, um, participation tips. Please have your camera on. The facilitator will unmute you when you need to speak. 
And then please use the raise hand feature in the Zoom when you want to speak. And then kindly use the chat function for any questions. We have people specially designated to extract your questions and your comments and they'll be attended to. Um, thank you so much. So uh, this is a beautiful, um, as I said, Famalat is hosting this teleeducation series and Famalat is all about enabling easier access to affordable animal health care. Um, so um, that's it for the introduction. Let's move to the next agenda. Let's move to the next item on the agenda. Please, the, um, the agenda. So a brief about Famalat. Um, Dr. Femi Kayade, can you please um, take over and just give us a brief about Famalat? If um, you're not available, right. we'll... no, okay. so I could. Okay. Uh, All right. Welcome, afternoon, uh, Dr. Tumsia. Good afternoon. Uh, good to have you, and thank you for the good job you're doing for us or the animal health uh, social enterprise. As you have clearly stated, what we want to do and achieve in Farmalat is to ensure that there's easy access to affordable. animal health care, million people. In 2050, we will be 400 million. So it's been estimated. The food system in Africa currently is weak. With increase in population, I suspect that it will be weaker. So if there are no intentional efforts to food system, uh, so if, if there are no intention. I think Dr. Femi is having issues with some, with his no, network. Uh, effort to strengthen the food. All right, so it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to this, uh, to this echo. And I think Dr. Tumsia is capable enough to handle every eventualities. Uh, please do have a wonderful session ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So that's a brief about Farmalat. And uh, we're bringing on um, somebody from MDOC, um, Adora or Olabisi, to please give us a brief about MDOC just for two minutes. Just give us a brief about Project Tecla. Um, Adora or Olabisi. Okay, um, let me just give some few seconds. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. I was hello. trying to unmute myself. I wasn't yeah. um, able to do so. Oh. Hello, everyone. Apologies for having my video turned off. Uh, my network has been active enough, so I'm trying to manage the bandwidth. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Adora. I'm a senior manager with MDOC. Uh, MDOC is a digital health uh, social enterprise. And one of the key things that we do is um, capacity building, trying to ensure that we contribute to the quality of care. And through, through our work in our quality network, we leverage the ECHO model to provide these um, capacity building opportunities. And we've done that in partnership with the University of New Mexico ECHO, and that partnership has extended to even many more social enterprises, one of which is Farm Alerts. Uh, and so we are leveraging this echo model to provide capacity building opportunities and to pretty much steer the conversation around quality uh, and improve the quality both around human health and now around animal health in partnership with Farm Alert. So um, we're happy for, uh, we're happy to be part of this session and we look forward to having even many more exciting sessions. Welcome everyone. Uh, it's going to be an exciting one. Over to you, uh, Dr. Tumsia. Okay, thank you, Adora. That's, um, that was a beautiful breath. Um, so, and then I would love to say this, we said it earlier, Famalat is actually the first in the animal health space to leverage the echo model. So we're going to take um, quickly, we're going to take a uh, pre-quiz, as I said earlier. So the pre-quiz is just some simple questions, five, 10 questions thereabouts to help us um, gauge the knowledge 
shared and gained at the end of, before and at the end of the presentation. So a poll will be up and um, I'll implore each and every one of you to take these questions. We're going to have this for three minutes. Uh, so the time starts now. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we can all start taking the quiz. It's just to help us um, measure what we've gained at the end of the session. So I employ each and every one of us, it's on your screen. Um, you can just answer the questions and we can get down to the presentation, to the um, didactic um, presentation. Okay, I haven't seen anybody attempt. It's 37 seconds away. And um, so I implore you all to please take this qu qu um, quiz. They're just simple, straightforward questions. Um, you're answering it um, based on anonymity. So your names are not actually going to pop up and nobody's going to come for you at the end of the day to ask why you failed or why you scored a very high um, score. So it's just um, to help us. Yeah, I can see someone taking two people. Okay, we're one minute away, um, just 5%. This is okay. Yeah, this is coming on well. Just keep answering, keep answering. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone on board, our hub experts, our case presenter and everyone else. You're acknowledged and appreciated. Thank you. So we're just all about knowledge sharing bi-directional knowledge sharing and that's why we're big on discussions after the presentation we're going to have 40 minutes to take discussions questions and answers okay i can see going on well 36 percent participation one minute 42 seconds gone um, this is going to go for just three minutes so please do participate in answering the questions it's actually fun <laughs> yeah Okay, we're two minutes gone. We have just um, literally one minute away and then we're taking down the poll quiz. But before then, please do participate. Yeah, 50%, I'll need more. So yeah. Okay, just 50% and then it's, it just stopped. Please, get, okay, yes, yes, okay, it's coming up. I guess a lot of people are listening. <laughs> Um, yes, 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 59%, I'll be needing more. I won't mind 70, you know, I said 50, but then we all want more. So we just have some few seconds to go. This is good, 60% is good. Okay, few seconds. And then we'll take down the quiz. We'll take down the poll, 62%. That's that's encouraging. Uh, yeah, so we have three minutes. Can we just end the poll and move to the next item on the agenda? Mm. So we had 65% um, after the poll. Can I have the screen back on, please? Um, we can take down the poll quiz. The poll has ended. Okay. Okay, so we have, for today we have Professor, as one of our hub experts, we have Professor S. O Okai. Okayetu, forgive me, sir, for any mispronunciation. Who is a um, um, prof is a professor of veterinary infectious disease with specialty in food animal practice with over 30 years of experience. He is currently the head of the Fulani Ambulatory Unit of the Veterinary Teaching Hospital, Amadubello University, Zaria. And then we have uh, the other hub expert as um, Dr. Can I have the screen, please? Okay, we have Dr. Mohammed Babashani, who is a lecturer, Large Animal Clinic of the Veterinary Teaching Hospital, Amadabello University, Zaria. He's also the breeding consultant for SAJ Foods Limited, um, Zaria, and, an, in, and a large animal practice mentor to a lot of young veterinarians that I can attest to. 
welcome and thank you for sparing our time to share your wealth of knowledge with us. So straight to the didactic um, presentation, Dr. Mohammed Babashani, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Over to you. Um, okay, Dr. Babashani. Can you hear me? Okay. okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Welcome, good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, well, thank you, sir. Okay. So over to you, so you have 15 minutes. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, can yes. I have my presentation up? Yes, we'll have the IT support control the slide, if that's okay with you. Um, yeah, so the slide will be up. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. We'll be talking about uh, a very important production disease, uh, the contagious uh, bovine pleural pneumonia which is a very important disease to so all livestock farmers, um, cattle farmers in Nigeria. Oh, can, we, can we move the slide to the next? Okay, so we'll look at a, a brief overview of the disease, the epidemiology, that's the distribution across the world, etiology, transmission, clinical manifestation, then the uh, pathology, then how to diagnose it, then the economic impact of the disease, how to prevent it, and what are the next steps. Next. So CBPP is, an, is a highly contagious infectious disease affecting cattle and water buffalo. The first report of the case um, was in Algeria in 1873. Um, it has been spread all over the world since then, and it principally attacks the lungs and the membranes of the lungs that line the thoracic cavity, that is the, the pleura, causing fever and respiratory sign. It is highly contagious, as I've stated earlier on, with mortality rates are uh, exceeding 50%. It, it causes great economic losses. CBPP is, is a reportable disease and is listed by the OIE code for terrestrial animal health. Next. Okay, this is the distribution across the world. Um, the purple and orange colors indicate that we have confirmed cases of CBPP. So you can see it ranges from Africa, Middle East, and, and Europe. Next. The disease is caused by a higher bacteria, Mycoplasma mycodis mycoides. Uh, initially, it was thought that only these small colonies are able to cause clinical disease, uh, but it has been found that even the large colonies can cause uh, clinical disease as um, the, the bacteria was isolated from the uh, fluids of the thoracic cavity of infected calves. Also, interestingly, it has been found that the bacteria has been isolated from aborted fetus, which suggests it might have a role to play in uh, reproductive diseases. Um, the organism has also been isolated from captive uh, wild goats, as well as camelids, which might suggest their role in the epidemiology of the disease. Next. So how is it transmitted? Uh, transmission is mostly by direct contact between infected um, cattle and susceptible hosts through inhalation of droplets disseminated by coughing of the infected animal. Also, uh, 
carriers of the organism has been uh, confirmed to spread the disease with in contact animals. There is no evidence of transmission through formites such as uh, human hands or other inanimate things that can serve as a I mean, there's no confirmation that this or mites can transmit the disease. Next. So what are the clinical signs? The clinical forms of the disease are divided into four. You have the hyperacute form, which is seen in about 10% of uh, infected hearts. The principal um, thing you see in the hyperacute form is that the animal is found dead overnight without premonitory clinical signs. Next. In the acute form, which affects about 20% of affected cattle, the, the onset is acute and the cause of the disease lasts between five to seven days. Principal signs you see here include pyrexia, uh, signs of pneumonia, abducted forelimbs, rapid abdominal movements, reluctance to move. We we'll also see uh, development of a shallow, dry cough, which is painful to the animal. Um, and there's also exercise intolerance. Other signs include mucopurina nasal discharge, stretch or extended uh, neck, and then we have seen a lot of cases presented with blood. And this is mostly as a result of inflammation of the vagal nerve, uh, resulting from pruritus. The subacute form occurs in 40 to 50% of animals, which uh, present with signs of the acute form, but uh, it's usually milder. And we'll have what to call recurrent fever. Sometimes if you take the temperature, it will be high. Other times it will be low. Then the last form is the chronic form, which is as a result of a natural evolution from both the acute and subacute stages. Clinical manifestation gradually uh, decreases. So mostly what you see is um, wasting of the animal uh, with just occasional fever and then loss of uh, loss of appetite. In young calves, we have seen cases of polyarthritis, and then uh, which results in lameness. Next. So, so on postmortem examination, usually we we'll see diffused um, signs of pneumonia, hepatization of the lobes of the lungs, and the marked, marked uh, pleural effusion on fibrino, fibrinous um, pleuritis. There's extensive pulmonary edema, especially in the acute form. And then you have formation of uh, sequestra, which is um, encapsulated necrotic pulmonary lesions, as shown in the figure by the side. This is usually referred to as the marbled lungs, which is a consolidation of uh, uh, the lungs of affected animals. This is classical of CVV. Next. So how do you diagnose the disease? Diagnosis is usually in the field, we rely on clinical examination and postmortem lesions. But to confirm it, you need to submit samples to the lab. Serological tests like a complement fixation test and ELISA will give you suggestive um, um, confirmation, but culture and then PCR confirmation is the most uh, reliable of the tests, okay? Next. So what, what is the economic impact of the disease? CVPP has great economic impact on the livestock industry. Uh, we have an estimated $2 billion um, loss due to CVPP in some African countries. In Nigeria, it's estimated that 2.2 um, billion naira is lost annually as a result of CVPP. And Nigeria, in combination with um, some states in Nigeria, particularly Sokoto and Kano State, in combination with uh, Niger Republic, has reported annual losses of over 220 
million uh, naira. Okay, Doc, we have just five minutes to go. Okay. Yes, yes. So my Thank slide you. is done. I'm no longer seeing it. <laughs> Okay, it's back on. All yes. right. Apologies. So next, yeah. next slide, please. Okay, I've, I've told you about the economic impacts. Next is uh, how do you control this disease? So control strategies as um, as documented by Al Haji et al. Twenty twenty, he he recommended four control strategies vaccination, treatment with antimicrobial agents, movement control, and then stamping out. So, um, so far in Nigeria, the most effective are the two treatment and um, vaccination. However, there are problems related to vaccination. Number one, um, there is low vaccine coverage across the states that have the highest cattle populations. For example, in Adamawa State, um, France is reported as low as 20% coverage. And then we have uh, the highest coverage I've come across is in Kano State, where they have up to 60% vaccination coverage annually. However, the, the main problem with vaccination is that you vaccinate animals within these states, and because it's a transborder, a transboundary disease, animals that are not vaccinated from foreign countries can troop in and then the cycle becomes a vicious one because you vaccinate animals and you have animals that are not vaccinated introduced another problem with vaccination is that um, the vaccinal strain is likely uh, uh, not the same as the one that is in circulation in the field so this constitutes another problem um, treatment we have over the years, we have um, instituted treatment with various regimens. For example, tylosine has been used and abused by farmers, uh, oxytetracycline, um, and then we have newer uh, antibiotics such as the uh, for, for, uh, nitro, for, nitro for us. Example is danofloxacin. Um, to control the disease, we have to also institute policies that would prevent transborder movement, or at least make sure that animals that will be moving into Nigeria will be fully vaccinated. The stamping out principle has been introduced in Nigeria. However, it's not effective because of lack of com compensation in the part of uh, the government. So next, I'll talk about the antibiotic treatments. Uh, Literature has shown that antibiotic therapy has reduced the infection rate by 50% and as well as the mortality rates. However, there's still problem with um, formation of lungus, which serve as uh, carriers of this uh, microorganism. So as long as they are lungus, then the infection will persist in the farm and there will be it becomes an endemic problem. It's already an endemic problem, and it's difficult to eliminate from the population. Next. So Advocin is uh, an antibiotic that has been tried, and it has reduced uh, mortality by as low as 40%. And then it has also been shown to reduce the spread of the disease within farms. So this is a very important uh, antibiotic that uh, requires more research work. What are the setbacks related to the use of antibiotics? It increases development of resistant strains because most Fulani people that use antibiotics, they give sub, uh, sub therapeutic doses. Uh, and this leads to development of strains that are resistant. So proper use of antibiotics is, is necessary. Then also it encourages formation of uh, sequestra, which uh, in which you have increased number of um, carriers in the hearts. Next. So what does the feature entails? So we have um, 
we still have to continue with vaccination. We need to develop newer vaccines, for example, the DNA <coughs> vaccines, which will target specific pro proteins and molecules on the, on the surface of the bacteria. Together with the human doctors, uh, we're vaccinating at concurrent times. So the, for example, human doctors will go to vaccinate against polio. Mentally, they finish vaccination. The hearts will now be guarded for CPPP vaccination. This will cover a lot of um, areas. It would increase the vaccination coverage. Also, we have to continue developing newer regimen for uh, treating clinical diseases. In the veterinary teaching hospital of Abus area, uh, clinicians have shown increased uh, elimination of the of clinical signs uh, with the use of oxytetracycline and dexamethasone. So we we'll have to continue clinical trials in order to uh, successfully eliminate the disease. So uh, the take home message is we have to increase uh, vaccination coverage, newer vaccines, then more research into the development of uh, antibiotic therapy, as well as government policies that will prevent transborder movement of animals without vaccination records. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Babishani. That was a beautiful presentation. And I'm sure we all have questions around it. So you can start preparing your questions, your comments and your suggestions. So we'll be moving to the next item on the agenda which is a case presentation by Dr. Robert Joshua, who is a private um, practicing veterinarian. So Dr. Um, Robert Joshua, you have five minutes to quickly take us through a case of CBPP you handled. The floor is yours. Dr. Robert Joshua, you have five minutes. Thank you. Can we have the screen up, please? Okay, Dr. Joshua, are you with us? Um, okay. Okay. Let's give him some few seconds. All right, hello. Oh, okay. Good, good afternoon, good afternoon doctor. everyone. Yes, I was muted. I could hear you, but then, uh, oh. yeah, thank you very much. Oh, welcome your... and thank you. So the floor is yours for the next five minutes. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the privilege and the opportunity. Um, yeah, just going straight to the point. The case I want to present here is just a case of management of a case of um, contagious bovine pure pneumonia in a cow. Uh, this case was under in the field, not in a... Uh, not on the farm actually. And then the case overview here we have is history, clinical presentation, diagnosis, the plan, the management, follow up, and then we'll also get to the conclusion. Next slide. All right. Um, on this date, 10th of October, I was called upon to attend to a cow. We just returned from the grazing area. Usually these herders take their animals to the to a grazing area where they spend a long time there. Sometimes may, it may be during, it may take the entire rainy season before they return. So, but this cow had this case and then I was told it, was, it, it returned like two days ago and then they called me to come and attend to it. And then after getting to the community, um, I, was, I was told the cow was three and a half years old and then, and then I asked of other medications and, what, and what, what they have done to this cow, what, other medication they administered to this cow. And I was given a list of drugs which included 10 mils of uh, cycling, which is commonly called LE, uh, 10 mils of tylosine, and then 100 mils of albendazole. Next slide, please. All right, on our examination, um, this was, these were the signs I noticed. The four limbs were adopted on arrival when I noticed, and then there was mild epiphora. And then we have oral and nasal discharge also. That's a picture. And then um, there was difficulty breathing. 
and then the head was lowered, the body condition was poor, the animal looks emaciated. This is part of the animal, uh, the body. Next slide, please. All right, and then the animal was depressed, the air was raised, there was anorexia, there was bruises. Um, there was bruises on the body, which I later realized it was, was as a result of the transport. Um, and then there was also pyrexia, the temperature was 40.2 degrees centigrade. Other signs that um, we may likely come across, I just included this, were a uh, slightly arched back. I didn't see this sign personally in the field, but this way, these are other signs that we may likely come across. Slightly hacked back, elbows are tucked out, and there's percussion, there's pain on percussion of the chest, there's respira rapid respiration. Um, the respiration is shallow and it's also uh, abdominal. The cough is moist, then there's also grunts that is heard at expiration. Next slide, please. All right. Um, then I thought of differentials even after seeing those signs. And the differentials that came from foot and mouth disease. I wrote this out because of the, uh, sorry, this is a typographical error here. I wrote this out because of the absence of oral and foot lesions. That was why I ruled out foot and mouth disease. And then um, I consider shimmy fever because of the head and the neck that was extended and around the uh, edge. Uh, the discharges are also sore from the mouth and the nose. And then I also consider bovine tuberculosis. Next slide, please. My plan was to advise them to isolate and quarantine this cacao immediately. And then also to begin in treatment and also to advise and sensitize the farmer on the impact of this disease. And then also to adv advise them on the irrational use of antibiotics and, um, and plan towards provision of metaphylaxis for the herd that's uh, still in the gra uh, grazing area. And then and also to report to my upline for confirmatory diagnosis and because this is a reportable disease. Next slide, please. All right, my treatment plan included um, neurofloxacin at 2.5 milligram per kg per day for three days consecutively. I also administered multivitamin, 15 mil. This I did this I did twice in a week for three weeks, and then I advised them to isolate, feed, and then water the this cow um, separately. And just to add to this, uh, the, uh, next slide, is okay. All right, uh, the follow-up, 48 hours, that's two days after I began treatment. Um, there's improvement in the appetite, and then at least the, when, when it's pre presented with brand, it's able to, they can heat up some feed. Then the temperature also, I noticed the temperature also was within the normal rate, even though it was on the high side. And then the respiration too, there was improvement. Next slide, please. So I recorded much improvement later on. I think that was about 10 days later from the animal. And this were the pictures I took. There's so much reduction from the discharges. Next slide, please. All right, and then um, two weeks after, uh, when I visited the community, I was, I was shown images of, um, of, this, of, the, of this very cow. This one happened to died while they were in the grazing area. So they took the pictures and sent it through WhatsApp to the community. So when I get there, I was shown this image. So the following images will be seen are what are the images that they got from the animals they lost in the field. They, they, they lost about, um, in total, they lost around, around three, the three, three animals in, in the herd, lost from the herd alone. So this was the lungs. They were was sent. Next, please. All right, this also the long picture. Next slide, please. So these are images of just the lungs that we received. So in conclusion, uh, CP is a reportable disease and uh, it causes great economic loss. Field diagnosis is quite difficult and uh, signs are not really particular of these diseases, and treatment is also becoming challenging due to irrational use of antibiotics in the field, from, especially by, by herders. Next slide. All 
All right. Um, so I just recommended this so that um, in line with, uh, together with, uh, with clinical science that we may have, we may come across in the field. We, there's also, uh, there are rapid, there are rapid uh, test kits I've come across actually in the internet. I have not had access to use any one of yet, but um, it's based on ELISA. So, but I believe if this can be used, because since it's a screening test, if this can be used together with uh, clinical science will come across in the field, it will help a lot in diagnosing this condition in the field. Thank you for listening. Next slide. All right, thank you for listening. Okay. All right, so thank you, uh, Dr. Joshua, for a well thought out uh, case. And so right now, before Dr. Tumtia comes back and take the question and answer, I want Professor Kaito uh, here with his uh, 30 years experience mm -hmm. uh, and more importantly, handling the Fulani uh, uh, unit of the ambulatory uh, process for Ahmad Bello University Teaching Hospital. Uh, Prof, sir, can you just take another three, four minutes and just give like an overview experience sharing uh, of what you encounter on the field and why this uh, disease is significant uh, before Dr. Tumsia comes up again and take questions and answers. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you are hearing me. Are you hearing me? Hello? Yes, Prof. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. CVPP has been a delayed that has been with you for a very long time. You you look uh, far away from uh, the from your laptop or your device. Oh, so if you could move fine. slightly closer. Can can the host unmute him? Yes. Oh. All right. Can you hear me now? Loud. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, but yes, looks like you're in the same place with Dr. Babashani. Oh, well, it's a bit far away from me. Okay, all right, then you can go ahead. Yeah. You can hear uh, all right. Uh, like I said, CBPP has been with us for a very long time, you know, and uh, I have been privileged to handle several cases on the field. But then let me correct one narrative when uh, Dr. Babashani was doing his presentation. You know, because uh, the theological agent of CBPP, Mycoplasma mycodius or species mycodius, you know, we used to attach either large colony or small colony. That has been removed. So the theological agent remains Mycoplasma mycodius or species mycodius. Thank you. Now, back to cases that I have seen. I have seen quite a lot, some of them very, very pathetic. You know, let me give you one instance. A nomadic man went to NVRI or went to JOS and purchased 20 vials of CBPP vaccine. The man had just about 50 animals in his heart. He got to his house, constituted the vaccine, and he administered these 20 vials to his 50 animals. Unfortunately for him, all of them came down with a severe case of CBPP. He came running to us in the hospital, we paid a visit to his farm, we just looked at him in the face and said, sorry, there is nothing we can do. He virtually lost all his animals. Okay. Now, CBPP is a disease that does not, you know, uh, uh, respond to treatment. And I will explain the reason why. And that is why, you know, when we are discussing treatment, tylosine, oxytretocycline, I just, I just frowned at it. 
you know, because it explains the reason why the disease has been endemic in this country. All right. Once the lung is seeded by the organism, the organism, mycoplasma, mycodes, or species mycodes, you know, establish itself in the lung, release certain polysaccharides, otherwise known as galactam. This polysaccharide with some enzymes necrotize the tissue around where the real organism is, you know, a, a, a stain. For that reason, it forms a capsule and that capsule is poorly vascularized. No matter the amount of treatment you give, the treatment you gave will not get to the seat where the mycoplasma organism resides. So you end up having a carrier and it is this carrier that continue to shape this infection in the heart whenever there is stress. So I personally have, you know, been trying to discourage treatment. What happens when you visit a herd and you discover that one animal in the herd is infected? What you do is you isolate and quarantine that animal. You do nothing to that very particular herd. You pay a visit again and keep telling your client that for anyone that shows sign or uh, are lagging behind during grazing, please isolate. You keep isolating until no additional animal, you know, show sign of getting new infection. And then you give a pre grace period of about two weeks, then you vaccinate. And that is the only way we can control this disease. But the moment we start using treatment uh, uh, protocol, honestly, sincerely speaking, we are killing ourselves. We will continue to remain with the disease in this country. You know, so that is it. And uh, 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 what is happening right now in the field is that a number of times you find animals getting infected with CBPP with other concurrent infection. So the problem is that we have to find out, apart from CBPP, does this animal have other infection? Like the case uh, the doctor handled, we need to know the environment where he handled that case, all right? If the environment it is happens to be area that you know you have latest flies abound in the place, then of course you cannot rule out African animal trypanosomiasis. And I've seen several cases of mixed infection, concurrent infection of CBPP and trips. Okay, so a number of times you know you realize that the trips will be there, the trip will suppress the immune system. And before you know it, once there is a pocket of infection in the heart, the infection will spread, all right? So, so that is it. So our main problem or our main emphasis on how to control the disease is by vaccination. However, we have problems with our vaccines. I have a PhD student who has just graduated. He did his survey in the Southeastern state of the country. And we realize that we have different serotype of CBPP organisms in the field, which are completely at variant with the strain that the vaccine was produced. Okay, so you have a scenario whereby you have your vaccine, which is completely different from the strains that are in the field. So you go there, you vaccinate, and of course, nothing happens. So we must, you know, work harder establish the strengths of CBPP organisms that are out there in the field. And then of course, NVRI will have to go back to the drawing board and see how they can produce a polyvalent vaccines that will take care of all the serotypes in the country. That way we are making a step. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, yeah. That was really interesting listening to you with all your suggestions and recommendations. It's, um, as I stated earlier before the session, I promised all of you are going home with valuable information. Exactly. While you were presenting, I noticed um, the president of the Veterinary Council just joined us in person of AIG, Aisha Tubaju. Yes. Thank you for joining, Ma. And I also noticed um, 
Professor Abdullahi Magaji. I'll have to recognize him. He, he was yes. the dean while I was in school. Yes. And I also noticed um, Professor Caleb Kudi yes. and um, Dr. Ada Oguchi from Zoitis, who is yes. also a ruminant um, Oh. practitioner. So the echo model is big around discussions, questions and answers so that we can all go home with better knowledge and better information about what we know. So we're going to open the floor for comments, questions and answers. So please do um, utilize the chat um, box, box and also the raise hand um, function. Oh. I'll unmute you where there's need for you to speak and please, you can get your questions um, coming. We have um, somebody specifically extracting the questions. So please do. OK, we have another question here. And I'm going to channel this question to Professor S.O. Okai too. They said, is there anywhere in the East that these vaccines can be obtained, sir? Hello, sir? We can hear you, you're muted. Can we unmute Prof, please? Can we unmute Prof, please? Okay, I think we'll just um, go on because of time. I think Prof can unmute himself. Okay, he, he can, can unmute, unmute himself. himself. Okay, Prof, you can unmute yourself. With yeah, I just, I just did it now. Okay. So okay, the question like is, like, is there anywhere in the yeah. East where these vaccines can be obtained? Yes, NVRI National Veterinary Research Institute, you know, they have outstation in virtually all the states of the Federation. So there you can access any type of vaccines that you want as long as you know, they produce these vaccines. So that is it. You know, they're okay. there. I may not know the particular location, but you can find them in the house zonal offices, house stations. Okay. So for, for, for a disease that can be prevented by vaccination, a lot of questions are coming around the use of vaccines. So somebody here is um, addressing yeah. this question to you, Prof. Sir. And they said, yeah. while you were giving recommendations on when um, animals in the herd have been noticed to be presenting signs, which of the groups should be vaccinated? Is it the ones that have been isolated or the free groups? This was a question from one of the participants. Oh, okay, okay, uh, uh, please listen to me. Uh, okay, what sir. I said you know, was that uh, the moment you are able to identify a pocket of infection in a herd, you isolate. Now that herd become highly susceptible you don't treat, you don't vaccinate. However, when you isolate, you give a quarantine period of 14 days. During that period, if no single animal show any sign, then it is assumed that the herd is clean. Then you can go ahead and vaccinate. But of course, you know the danger of vaccinating animal that is infected. If you do that, the animal will come down with full blown infection. So you must observe the quarantine period of two weeks. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so somebody is asking here, most of the questions specifically uh, addressed to Prof. Sir. So I will address these questions to you because most questions are coming to Prof. Yeah. So somebody said, if animals are isolated as recommended without yes. therapeutic intervention, yes. It means we can allow some of these animals to succumb to the infection. This can lead to significant economic losses. So how do you propose farmers go around this? See, it is rather very unfortunate, you know, because CBPP is a very deadly disease. Once you isolate, you isolate far away from the animal, I mean from the heart. The person that will feed this animal will have no business with the remaining animals, okay? And there is nothing you can do. At the end of the day, you have to advise the animal to be salvaged, if truly the disease has to be controlled. Because the issue is that if you administer antibiotic, either adwocene or tylosine or also tetracycline, 
what guarantee do you have that you will have 100% purity? At the end of the day, once you have a carrier, a carrier, the moment you introduce the same animal into the herd, once there is stress, it will continue to shed this mycoplasma organism among the herd. And remember, if you have an animal, this transmission is via aerosol. Animal within 200 meters can pick the infection via aerosol. So we have to be very, very careful. All right. So the, the, the main emphasis, you know, is that, well, the animal has to be salvaged. There's no two way about it. If the heart has to be clean of CBPP. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, sir. Thank you for that um, explanation. So this question goes to Dr. Babashani. Somebody is asking from your presentation, you made mention on the use of um, dexamethasone as one of um, the treatment regimens. But he said the use of dexamethasone should be a great concern to us as veterinarians. So he said, please, can you shed more light on the use of dexamethasone as one of the treatment regimens for CBPP? Dr. Babashani, this question is for you. Okay, yes, I've reported that uh, people have used it. Um, the advantage of using dexamethasone is it increases tissue perfusion. So when antibiotics are used in the lungs that have been sequestrated by uh, the organism, uh, it increases uh, the tissue perfusion so that the antibiotic will reach some of the target um, cells. That's the advantage of using it. However, it comes with its own uh, disadvantage. Uh, apart from lowering the immune system, if the animal is pregnant, it will cause abortion in such animals. But as I said, people have used it in the field and it has given them results. Although it's not sure whether it has cleared the organism or not, because we have not carried out studies to investigate that. Okay, um, thank you for that, um, Dr. Babashani. I hope the person who asked the question got some clarification um, about the use of dexamethasone as part of the treatment regimen for CBPP. So professors, um, Professor Esso Okaitos, a lot of people are asking if they can get a vaccination protocol to abide by, let's say, okay, at what age, um, when to vaccinate, how to vaccinate. So like, let's say establishing a vaccination protocol for CBPP, I think that would be very helpful. And that would be, um, the, like that, that would be a handful of um, take, home, take home information for veterinarians okay. on the platform. Okay, okay. Yes, okay. Let me quickly give a rundown. Now, you, you vaccinate cows. If you're in an endemic environment, you can vaccinate each three months. Okay, then thereafter, it becomes a yearly event. That is every year you vaccinate. Now, most of the problem is usually how our vaccines are handled. Vaccine must be stored at four degrees centigrade from the point of production to the point of administration. In other words, the cold chain must be maintained. And CBPP organisms are heat larvae. They are easily destroyed when there is a change in ambient temperature. So the cold chain must be maintained. And then of course, the type of diluent you use is very, very important. Now, if you choose to use distilled water, distilled water, yes, you can use it, but you must administer your vaccine within 30 minutes. Otherwise the vaccine will be inactivated. The best diluent that you can use for vaccination is normal saline. Normal saline is isotonic to plasma fluid. So when you suspend your vaccines in normal saline, and then of course you use amber color bottle, amber color bottle that will reduce the intensity of sunlight in your vaccine. Then of course you have a leverage of a longer period you know, of time to administer your vaccine. Then of course, it is an, like I say, it is an annual event. Every year, you know, you administer, you know, because the immunity conferred by the vaccination is not permanent, it's not solid. So you vaccinate, 
Next year, you have to vaccinate again, all right? So, but you must administer that vaccine very well. In other words, you must give subcutaneously. If you made the mistake of giving intramuscularly, that is when the animal is struggling, you jab your needle, you are going IM. And the moment you go IM, the body will recognize the vaccine has antigen and they mobilize inflammatory cells. And before you know what is going on, within one, two weeks, there'll be massive swelling at the site of administration of the vaccine. A lot of animal have been lost in that process. Okay, so you have to be very, very careful. Maintain cold chain, use correct diluent, and then of course you are in good shape. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Prof. But looks like you wanted to make a comment around the dexamethasone that uh, Dr. Bobasha- oh, Okay, yes. I have, in a very bad scenario, I have reasons to use uh, a dexamethasone, but then you must not administer it more than once. You know, because you know that dexamethasone, just like uh, Baba Shani says, it enhanced tissue perfusion. The whole essence is that you have achieved high plasma level when you administer your antibiotic. You want an agent that will dilate the blood vessel, allow more blood to go to the lung, so that even those microcapillaries, you know, in the lungs will be more functional to carry your active antibiotic into where the microorganism is located. That is the essence. Thank you. Um, thank you. Sorry, my network um, bobbed me off, but I'm back. Uh -oh. Um, so we have more questions coming for you, Prof, please, and I will please. give it to you specifically. Somebody yeah. um, from the audience said he had a conversation with one of the researchers because you recommended the vaccination at three months and then subsequently a yearly booster be given. Yes, yes. He had a conversation with one of the researchers at MVRI and the researcher, the researcher told him uh, to that the level of... Uh, the antibody drops after six months. So it yes. is recommended to repeat the vaccination after six months. What's your take on that, sir? No, we have to understand that we are using a live vaccine, live but attenuated. In fact, we have a vaccine that reverse to virulence. Okay, so you, you have to be very careful, okay? Like I say, in an endemic environment, we have reason to vaccinate cows as early as three months. But in a non-endemic, your vaccination at six months. Okay, so that is it. That is the protocol. All right. Okay, so that means the vaccine is a vaccine protocol, but then you also have to put into cognizance the endemicity, the endemicity of the in the area. Exa exactly. Okay, so I hope we all got, got that. Though at the, before we call it a day, we're going to give Prof five minutes to give us his recommendation so you can get your pen ready and your paper and then Prof will give us his recommendation on um, plan on action, plan of action in case you have a suspected outbreak of CBPP, the vaccination protocol. So we're going to come back to that because we're getting right. recommendations from him. Okay. So let's move to other questions. Um, most of the questions, somebody here is saying, um, I'm going to, um, direct this question to Dr. Baba Shani. He said, "How um, a participant is asking, how do you advise the nomadic herders to effectively isolate suspected cattle, especially during migration?" <laughs> wow, that's a tough one. Because uh, you can do it, but it's not that they will follow your advice. Mm. The first thing they usually do once they have to, is to go and buy drugs and start injection. If you look at the case that was presented by Dr. Ross, uh, they said they injected 10 minutes to adults. Started. Of course, that is therapeutic. So, but with uh, you can utilize extension workers. Your staff as well can serve as extension workers to educate the farmers on the needs for isolating sick animals and then notifying the veterinarian. Of course, the veterinarian has also to report because uh, CBPP is a reportable disease. But I, I doubt if most of us report diseases to the um, right authorities. So the first thing to do is to educate them on the need for reporting the disease and the dangers of allowing the animal to continue grazing with the others. 
as well as uh, dangers of spreading to other herds. So that's important. Um, another thing is, as I said, extension is very vital. Most of these uh, herders walk around with their radio sets. So the use of uh, media houses to educate them on all these things is very important. I don't know if Prof has more to add from his experience. Okay, Prof, sir, I think it's an important question because even on the farm, you find it very hard to advise farmers on how to isolate their sick um, animals, stock more or less of the nomadic herders moving yeah. on this. Yeah, so sir, what's your take on that? No, the, the issue is that you as a vet, you visit this farm from time to time. You are the one that make a diagnosis of CBPP. Okay, for the client, except of course those that are, you know, well experienced and well endowed. You know, once an animal is sick, they know that, yes, it could be CBPP, it could be ABCD diseases, you know, but then advise them that they have to isolate. If you ever visit a Fulani herd, the Fulani herd is an open land. If not because of the insecurity that we're having now, isolating an animal far away from the herd, you know, it's not a big deal. They should be able to do it. It's a question of getting a few sticks around, tying them around, and then with a the gate, they drive these animals in. Or alternatively, if they cannot do that, once the animal is established that is CBPP positive, get rid of the animal. Then you are arrested from the trouble. Sorry, somebody posted a question. I just read it. Uh, uh, permit me to answer him. Uh, okay, Prof. Uh, all right. The, the person said, you know, when you went to dilute CBPP vaccine, you get 100 ml bottle, put your diluent, and then you constitute, and then you administer one meal subcutaneously. That is wrong. It's very, very wrong. You did that because of ease of convenience. You want to administer one meal. The correct you know, protocol is that the NVRI that produces a vaccine, if you read the level, they said dilute in 50 ml of normal saline. Now, each bottle has about 10 raised to power seven number of microbes. If you over dilute, by the time you are administering your vaccine, you are over dilute, you are given an over diluted vaccine, which the amount of microbes you are depositing in the animal might not be enough to trigger immunologic reaction sufficiently that will protect the animal for the number of periods it is meant for. So that is it. Uh, we have another question. Somebody is asking that rather than repeating the yearly dose, is there a way one can check for the immune response? Just the way you, um, just like serum monitoring um, for antibodies, is that also obtainable? Is it practical? Yeah. It's practical, but then the antibody you check and see it might not be sufficient to be protective. Okay, so because the antibody decreases with time. By the time it's nine months, the level of antibody titer you find in the body of the animal is not protective. So you have to administer again. It's like you are giving a booster every year. Okay, so, so the advice is just, yes, I'm, I'm with you. Because I guess the person is asking rather than subjecting, rather than repeating the vaccine on yearly basis, is there need for, but with what you've said, I hope the person has gotten a better um, clarification. That, 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 is, that is not to this thing. Okay. All right. So somebody here answered about someone, someone who asked of the availability of the vaccines. I don't know if the person read it, no, but the person said instance, they have. No, I'm, I'm actually reading out what somebody suggested. Uh, yeah. Somebody uh, said, said they have yeah. sales reps. They yes. have sales reps all around um, the country exactly. who are um, available to supply you with these vaccines. Exactly. So um, we have a lot of um, our professors and our senior colleagues in the house. So I've not seen anybody um, use the raise hand feature. So if you have a suggestion or an input on this particular topic we're discussing today, please feel, feel free to use the raise hand feature. I will unmute you and you can give us your take because we have 40 minutes for, the, um, for this discussion and we've eaten out um, more than 50% of the time. 
but we can also take more questions and more suggestions. Somebody is asking, um, Prof, that how do you use aminophilin? Well, aminophilin is a bronchodilator. I have never used it. What is the aim? To dilate the bronchioles or what? So I've never used it. So I don't think it has any added advantage. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a drug that is being used, you know, to control asthma in humans. So I don't think it will find a place, you know, in veterinary medicine. I've never tried it, you know. So that's okay. Um, all right, let me see. Um, I can see. Let me check. Okay, I can see Dr. Charles Ibe and Dr. Ada Oguchi. So I'll give you each um, one minute. That's 60 seconds to quickly give us your input. And um, on this case, so Dr. Charles Ibe, the floor is yours. I just asked to unmute you. Yeah, thank you. You did not deface me today, Sincere. <laughs> thank you. I'll okay, it okay, it quite, a, okay, it quite a long time. A real long time. Indeed. Honestly, honestly, when I look at you and look at your history from your humble beginning, I feel proud of you. And you know what I you know what I mean. These young ones will not know what I you know yes. what I mean. Yes. Um, uh, you see, okay, so you made one, one statement here. Uh, you see, you know, science evolves and evolves. Because yes. why, why studying mycoplasma, even to this poultry level where I am now, I'm not in the large animals. Yes. I'm only here for yes. convenience. It, it, um, the organisms, be, are they still, in, in are they still molecules? No, they are. Um, they are, they are idea, my idea yeah. of all the organisms are molecules because I we monkey with some in poultry like um, CRD. Mm. Yeah. Uh, my yeah. idea is that they are very pliable and they are very fla fragile, just like an egg. Oh, yes. right? Just like yes. an egg, just like an egg without an eggshell. And do they still mm. maintain the the egg yolk appearance in their anyway? You're not a my egg yolk appearance in um, in their selected media it, well well, uh, uh, well my, my... Oh, oh, okay the, the the thing about uh mycoplasma yes it's very fragile you know you know it doesn't even have a cell wall yeah let me uh, let me learn let me learn because okay, if okay. if it's too, they are very fragile and you are saying that you travel some kilometers Close to 100 meters. Aerosol, via aerosol, 200 via meters. aerosol, okay, because yes. of the physiological media. Yeah. Sorry, yes. physiological they are droplets. Okay. Exactly, they are droplets. Okay, yes. the, the, the droplets. I, yes. Well, that, my movement now to, to MVRI is um, they need to do a lot of work. To get exactly. Us, to get us the pathotypes and the serotypes. Yes. Of these organisms. I was there on 3rd February. I gave them a lecture from my own field simplicity, you know, from a layman point of view. Because it's in discussion and conversation like this, they'll be able to throw up a lot of research. Clinicians yes. cannot work in isolation from research. Exactly. And all these things you are mentioning today about serotype, pathotypes, and um, and, and um, uh, immunotypes. But what I tell, I want to tell the first speaker is this. Let you know, I'm not a researcher, but I can give you clue to research. The, the you know, it was talking about arthritis, arthropathy, and my understanding yes. of organisms that do not that do not have predilection on joints. When they started, they will, when they will start developing problem on the is is an indirect problem. Maybe from the, the third type of hypersensitivity. Um, sensitivity. So let them look at reactions, antigen antibody reactions that flowed to those joints. Uh, you know, this, this can give them a clue to what is causing that pathogenicity at an aberrant site. Because the joints are not aberrant sites of mycoplasma, apart from exactly. mycoplasma exactly. synovia in chicken. So maybe they look. Yeah. Let them look at. Let them look at uh, uh, the antigen, or even the second type of hypersensitivity. Hello. Let them look at the second yeah, type of hypersensitivity and the third type of hypersensitivity. Might be that is what's causing it. And you, you, you. Let me. You are very brilliant in discussing chemotherapy of 
of um, uh, um, CBPP. And then in all mycoplasma, I've never seen any mycoplasma as chemotherapy. They will my end go on um, shutting it down, but it's coming up again. Yes, well, it's coming up, yes. <laughs> when you shut it in poultry, I'm discussing poultry because that's why I'm a major. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so oh, much, yeah. Dr. Oh, Charles please. eBay. I ran away uh, this from- This is really Tato. interactive. I would say from my end, Yes, I'm I ran enjoying- back. I ran I'm away. The sincere, sincere don't block out elders when elders talk. So I'm not blocking you. I'm just telling you that I'm enjoying the interaction. When, That's all when elders <laughs> talk, all you think is so that you learn to be elder and you will be an elderly elder. Anyway, so uh, I'm just actually you. commenting how interactive the session is. I wasn't yes. planning to block you. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. So you, you, you are a better veterinarian than me because you're a professor and then probably I'm a marketer and a farmer. And then um, your area is very dangerous. Katu, um, I, I ran away from Katu kick and horse kick. And that's yeah. why I went to poultry. So that when poultry kicks me, All right. I will survive. Right. Okay, so shut good. me down, shut me down, I'm okay. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Charles. If it's, re it's always, it's always fun listening to you talk, sir. So, yes, um, so yes. I'm going to unmute one more person. Who has um who was raising his hand? Okay. Okay, I can see that Dr. Ada Oguchi. Yes. Uh, yes okay, I let mean. me let me unmute you, so you can give us um two minutes. Um, Dr. Ada, uh, the floor is yours. Yes. Can you hear me, Kinsey? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think mine is just um to mention that um just to share an information that I am aware that um there is a lab dedicated to um, research on mycoplasma in, in Nigeria, domiciled at um, the University of Illorin Veterinary Teaching Hospital and funded by um, some researchers in the University of Edinburgh in the UK. So um, the head of that lab is one um, Dr. Lauren Scholler. And um, basically all they do there is to work on mycoplasma especially CBPP and um, CCPP and the likes. Um, for those who might be interested in running samples or in um, some investigations that, um, you know, NVRI might become too difficult to access or maybe because they want to run it rather quickly. Um, that's, um, that's one place that you might want to um, pitch your tent. I think they have um, facilities all the way um, up to PCR. For diagnosing mycoplasma, and I thought um, I should just share that oh, information. Right. Okay. Thank you, friend. Thank you so much, Dr. Ada, for that information. Yes. I'm sure we all grab it. Yes. University of Illinois, so they have a designated lab for mycoplasma Hello? screening. So that's a good information. So um, I didn't, I can't see any questions yeah. coming up. So, sir, as one of the hub experts mm. for today, I will give you five minutes to give us your recommendation, a list of what all of us on this platform can take home and add to our already existing knowledge on CBPP. Um, Professor Okaito, you have the floor for the next um, five minutes. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, uh, you are muted, but then maybe I'll be able to, uh, I see the direction you're going, you know, uh, my take in this, you know, uh, in conclusion, I would have loved a scenario whereby NVR will wake up, one, okay, and then go out to the field, find out the type of serotypes we have. Because if you look at this T144 vaccine that has been in circulation, it's been there since in the 80s. And of course, you know, diseases mutate, you know, they change, you know, so we must be current with the disease itself. So one, let them go out, screen these animals nationwide. They have the mandate. They can do it in collaboration with federal livestock and pest control services. You know, because um, I was privileged to participate you know, in a program, they call it L Press. You know, they were trying to, you know, come up with uh, a document for the control of CBPP in Nigeria. And of course, 
to see how the disease can be controlled. Okay, but then before that comes up, I think the 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 the, the NVRI owes a duty to tell us the number of stereotypes we have in this country. And of course, vaccines control must be put in place so that not every Tom, Dick, and Harry will go to the market and buy CPPP vaccine and then go and jab. That way, you know, we are further creating more problems. Okay? So that is my take on this. Thing. Otherwise, it's a disease that can be controlled. If other countries can exterminate it, I don't see the reason why Nigeria cannot. But as we are today, you know, the disease is endemic. There is hardly a heart of cattle you will go and scream, you will not see CBPP. So what are we doing? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. So for a disease that is ravaging and costing so much economic loss, yeah. I think this is a wake up call to all stakeholders yeah. in the research, in clinical practice, policymakers, so we can all wake up and play our part to make sure we bring an end to this um, disease that is costing us so much, millions of dollars, millions of naira. It depends on where you're. Um, okay, while um, you were giving your, we're answering the questions, I saw Dr. Ghani yes. Enaholo join. Thank you yes. for joining, yes. you're welcome, sir. <laughs> and at the end of it all, what we all need to take home is, this is a disease that can be treated that can be prevented via vaccination. Because from, for me, I, 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 you know, you come up with treat, treatment regimens for certain diseases, but if at the end of the day, you're going to leave longers in the herd who will continue, or carriers as we call them, who will continue to spread this disease in the herd, then the best thing to do is to prevent the disease entirely from even coming up. So this is a wake up call for everyone. and. Um, we have just some few minutes to go. The session was meant to last for 90 minutes, but we're Nigerian, so we can go a little overboard, but not too far. And I also um, want to recognize the acting registrar in person of Dr. Olado Tufadipe. Thank you so much for joining. We have about 127 participants. More than that, we had some join and some leaving along the line, but this is one of, for me, this is one of the most interesting sessions we've had. And so the next thing after the expert recommendation is just for us to take it's just for us to take the post quiz. It's the same question as the pre-quiz. Um, can we have the screen please? Um, okay. Post quiz, yes. We're going to take it for just three minutes. Can we have the questions up please? Okay, so you have three minutes to answer the questions. They're just simple, straightforward questions. I implore you to do that. This is just going to help us measure the knowledge gained before and after the presentation. Thank you very much. 19, 19 seconds and nobody has attempted. Ouch. Okay, yes, now we have people attempting. Okay, so we have three minutes. Sorry about the noise, it's raining heavily here in Katrina. Okay, okay, okay. One minute gone. We can all do better. <laughs> okay, 17%. We can do more. This, is, this, this was an interesting session. So we should all be excited to partake in the post -team. It's fun actually. For those who, who were not present when we had the quick quiz, so you're, you're answering based on anonymity. So your name is not going to show, your number isn't going to show. We just want to use the data to measure the knowledge shared and gained at the end of the session. Thank you. We can do better. 
40 percent, 41 percent. Coming up. I want us to get to 50 percent and possibly more. Okay, it's coming up. We have less than a minute to go before we take down the polls. So you can quickly just um, answer the questions. It won't take you five more than 10 seconds to answer the question. Okay, so we just hit 50% participation. Um, I'd ask for more. <laughs> We have about 20 seconds before we take down questions. Okay, okay. Um, just some few seconds to go. And um, I have 57%, I think we can do more. 60% won't be bad. Okay. Um, we uh, have fifty nine percent. Can we just answer and give me sixty <laughs> percent? Anyways, thank you all for participating. It was really informative and interactive for me, and I'm sure for everyone else. Um, can we take down the poll question? Uh, question? So thank you so much. Um, it has been an interesting and interactive session. I want to say a very big thank you to all our hub experts, the case presenters, the case presenters, sorry, our elderly statesmen who took out time to join and contribute to the session. Looking forward to more interactive sessions and informative sessions. The ECHO model is big, is big on bi-directional flow of information from the experts and the participants, vice versa. Thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. and um, Professor S.O. Okayeto. Thank you so much, Dr. M.B. Babashani, Dr. Um, Robert Joshua, I got the name right, and every other person who contributed. Thank you so much. And so the next thing on the agenda is just some um, announcements and okay. next step. Dr. Tumsia, you, you don't want to share the answer to the first quiz? Oh, okay, I'm supposed to, my maybe, apologies. Maybe the um, first zero percent, maybe the offer. Dr. Baba Shani, are you still with us? We're actually supposed to answer the questions together. I missed that part. Okay, I'm with you. Okay, um, can I have the questions so we can just read them out and see if what we answered and what the answers are from our hub experts. Can I have the questions up, please? All right, so Dr. Tumsia, I think I can see the questions. Okay, I'm wondering I can't why you see cannot see the questions. So maybe I can just quickly take this. Uh, the first question What is the causative agent of CVPP? Uh, there's Mycoplasma bovis, there's Mycobacterium bovis, there's Mycobacterium mycodis, subspecies mycodis, there's Mycoplasma mycodis, subspecies mycodis. What's the answer, Dr. Babasha? So D, D is the answer. All right, so impressive. 77% so of the participants actually chose uh, D. So you said D is the answer, right? D, yes. Mycoplasma, right. mycodis, suspicious mycodis. Thank you so much. The second question, the following are means of transmission of CBPP except the first indirect contact with infected animals, direct contact with infected animals, formites, and long guards. Well, the, the, answer, the answer is C, formites. Formites. Now I think uh, we need to take the class again because just <laughs> that. <laughs> So you know when we were said when I saw the questions I need to set by a university lecturer so you need to be careful <laughs> so just thirty percent and the next question CBPP is preventable through vaccination with TC vaccines antibiotics injection strict biosecurity without vaccination swamping out which is a correct question answer that's a vaccination 
Fantastic. So I think everybody listening to this, 84% of people got that correctly. Number four, the estimated financial loss due to CBPP in Nigeria is 20 million, 250 million, uh, 200 billion, uh, 2.8 billion. Which is it? 2.2 billion. All right. So 46% of uh, participants, uh, which is actually the highest uh, in the option, if you have written 80 billion, maybe there will have been a lot of confusion. But thank you. 46% <laughs> got it. The fifth question, which is slightly very dicey also, the chronic form of CBPP is characterized by the following signs, except pyrexia, wasting, coughing, polyarthritis. Which is the correct answer? Okay, I'll say um, A. All right, so it is a session. I will have loved the situation where Dr. Tumsia, if you will. Will and then you can now wrap up with the announcement. Okay, Dr. Sammy, 30 seconds each. So, Professor Caleb Pudi, the floor is yours for 30 seconds. Thank you, sir. Hey. Network. Okay, so uh, I think um, cross network. Okay, okay, okay. Presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, you're breaking, but we can pick out a few words. Can you hear me? Yes. Not clearly, sir. The network is breaking. Oh, yeah. I don't think the network is. So maybe we can move to the former director MVRI to take um, 30 seconds from you, sir. Um, can we unmute him, please? I think Prof. Um, Caleb is having um, issues with his network. Good afternoon. Thank you all. Good afternoon, ma'am. Sorry, my name is David Shamaki. My, my voice is feminine, so, but it's David Shamaki is the name. Oh, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> I totally heard something. Yes, it's just, just to react. So the floor is yours for Professor thank you. Professor Kaito, you know, in his closing remarks, talk of I'm going to DC to, 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 for surveillance. As of the time I left Bong, uh, uh, the there were 1,000, over 1,000 isolates of ICBP, CBPP in, 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 in MBRI. What we had, and then some of them were quite different from the vaccine strain. So we, there was attempt to initiate, I, I visited um, Muguga in Nairobi, and they were doing subunit vaccine research for CBPP vaccine production because of the diverse nature of CBPP isolates they also had. So we try linking up with them, but with the advent of, um, of COVID, funding was a big problem until the time I retired. So definitely VOM is doing a lot of surveillance because we have a lab for CBPP vaccine. We were involved in uh, uh, a lot of uh, testing before using uh, ELISA. Eliza for that matter, which uh -huh. so the next test really is that because you still CBP vaccination is a problem, so you still need to check and see whether, whether the diverse experience that you have you can get enough information to produce so many vaccines, whether polyvalent or univalent, depending on what it is. 
But the major problem we have on ground is the diversity of what is on ground now. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Um, at least we have an update because most of the times the problem is we don't really get to hear all of these things happening. So everybody just assumes nobody's doing anything. But with this information, now we know that MVRI is on top of um, the MARTA and trying to make sure um, the right thing is done. Um, I don't know if um, Professor Caleb Pudi's network will permit him to give us his own 30 seconds bits. Um, Professor Caleb Pudi. 30 seconds. Can we unmute him, please? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Good afternoon. Okay, I think his network is still not permitting him. But um, before I call it a day for all of us, I picked out, um, okay. His network is terrible. I picked out um, Dr. Babashani. I don't know if he was- okay. Thank you very much, sorry. You do not. Um, okay, now I think the network just bumped him out. So, um, somebody suggested the use of certain medium to make sure we get the information on how the on how to manage these cases when Fulani herders or livestock farmers cite some of the signs and symptoms. And somebody mentioned using radio. That is not really a bad idea. So officially. I know a lot of people have seen it. We launched the Farm Alert Media, um, I think about three or four weeks ago, for, forgive my lack of um, accurate um, accuracy. We launched the Farm Alert Media. So this is a call for volunteers out there who can come up with programs to make sure we pass out the right information to the right group of people at the right time. So I wouldn't mind someone coming up with a program in different languages, Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba, to help these farmers understand what's going on, the Fulani herders, what to do when they, before they call, they call in for veterinary assistance. So we're calling out to volunteers to create programs and make sure we strengthen the animal health system in Nigeria and Africa at large. Thank you so much. Quickly for a minute, you can drop it in the chat section. What other topics would you want us to address? What other topics would you want us to discuss on this um, tele-education series? The chat box is there. We just give you one minute and we're going to extract your suggestions and we're going to work with them. Thank you so much once again for joining. I hope we all got enough valuable information to go out there and share with our spares. And okay, some more questions are coming. We'll put them down and possibly get um, answers to them um, and share with you. Um, okay, um, we're getting suggestions. Keep them coming. We're going to take them for just a minute at most, and then we call it a day. We're supposed to have this for 90 minutes, but we just went a little overboard, but I think that's fine. <laughs> okay, we're getting suggestions. Okay, 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 keep it coming. ASF, that's um, African swine fever, okay. Um, thank you so much everyone for joining. I think that's it. And um, okay, we still have some coming. I can see a lot of ASF. Please do follow us on all our social media platforms, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. All you have to do is just type farm alert and we're there, sending your suggestions, sending your um, comments. Your compliments too would be good too. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you for coming. <laughs>